And I'm Keith Gamble, the president of the Indiana State Teachers Association. I want to welcome you tonight to tonight's event. And a big thank you to the amazing work of ISPA's Racial Affairs Committee in creating programs such as this that spotlight the important work that is needed uh, for all of our students. So thank you all so much for your attendance and thank you to all who are making tonight possible. With that, I'm happy to turn this over now to one of our co-chairs of the Racial Affairs Committee, Ron Swan. Ron? Thank you, President Keith. I want to welcome you to a special screening of Harriet Tubman, Visions of Freedom, co-hosted by the Racial Affairs Committee, and a special shout out to our partners at WFYI, Public Media and Community Engagement Team, and DePaul University. Before we begin, we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that we are on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Tonight, we will review a new documentary produced by the Maryland Public Television that premiered on PBS stations around the country last fall. The film tells the story of Harriet Tubman and her life beyond the familiar parts of the, of the story. At this time, I'd like to introduce Wafa, the co-chair of the Race and Affairs Committee. Good evening, everybody. Um, after we watch a shortened version of the film, Dr. Sahan Satarzadeh will lead us through a discussion. And she's gonna share um, some really great discussion questions with us as we go throughout the program. By the way, I was curious, how many of you out there are holding a viewing party tonight? Drop your answers in the chat. And if you are, let us know how many more people are joining us for this awesome event tonight. Well, without further ado, I wanna make sure that I introduce Dr. Sahar Satarzadeh. Um, she is a proud daughter of refugee settlers. Dr. Satarzadeh is an assistant professor at education studies and affiliated with Africana studies and Latin American and Caribbean study programs at DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana. She's also a research associate chair for critical studies and higher education transformation at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Prior to her current roles, she worked for San Diego City Schools as a certified emotional behavior specialist and as an English and IT teacher at the Banani International Secondary School in Chisambe, Zambia. So I can go on and on about her. We have an amazing person here joining us tonight and we're truly honored to have her here with us. But before we begin, um, I want to make sure that we can, we all here want to make sure that we can keep this as a constructive and open space for learning, um, for learning and having conversations. So we ask that you're going to follow the following rules of engagement. The first one, be open to learning something new. The second one, conduct yourself respectfully in breakout rooms or discussion. The third one is communicate in the chat and verbal comments, please, without any personal attacks. Um, and this is me putting on my teacher hat. If you violate any of these conversation guidelines, we're gonna reserve the right to remove you from the event. Um, we're glad that you're here though. Um, we want you to now sit back and enjoy this abbreviated version of the film, Harriet Tubman, Visions of Freedom. Go down, Moses, way down in the Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Shh. 
she would hear voices, she would hear singing, she would see fire burning, or she would hear water rushing. She would have very, very vivid dreams of her flying over fields as a free woman. God's time is always near. He set the North Star in the heavens. He gave me the strength in my limbs. He meant I should be free. She often believes that these voices and visions are direct from the divine when she's in the open on the Underground Railroad. Her visions did mark her path at different points and frankly often gave her a sense of invincibility. She was a very small woman. She was <laughs> no larger than five feet tall, but she was able to escape and free 70 or more persons back and forth and back and forth, knowing that each and every time she was risking her life and risking the lives of those persons that she brought with her. Harriet Tubman is famous as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, but she was also a leading abolitionist, a friend of some of the most powerful men and women reformers and radicals of her day, a suffragette, a spy, a scout, She's a Civil War soldier. One of the things that Harriet believed in is that God didn't mean for anybody to be a slave. Freedom should be universal. It should be universal. In the eastern shore of Maryland, Dorchester County is where I was born. I remember I prayed to God to make me strong and able to fight. And that's what I've prayed for ever since. In 1822, an enslaved couple named Ben and Rick welcomed a little girl named Araminta. The new baby was born in Maryland. In the states to the north, slavery was already outlawed, while Maryland and the states to the south relied on enslaved labor. Maryland was in transition in the 19th century, and more specifically on the eastern shore of Maryland, where enslavers typically had smaller plots of land smaller numbers of enslaved people working their farms. It really created a different kind of economy, one that required many enslavers to rent out the people they called their property. Harriet Tubman, by the time she's five, six years old, she becomes caught up in that web of being hired out. A childhood experience in slavery is not a childhood. The idea here is that slavery was a profit-driven industry, and slave owners extracted the most profit from all of their enslaved people throughout their lives. Well, I wonder, will I ever get back home? Hey. Harriet Tubman's experience of a child was particularly hard. She did things like uh, work in the swamps, catching muskrats, uh, where she got very sick and contracted measles and eventually became so ill, she had to be sent home. Well, it must have been the devil to me yeah. Yeah. She was required to clean the house at six years old. Um, she didn't know how to clean a house. She also had to babysit a colicky baby who would cry a lot, and every time the baby cried, then the mistress would whip. Um, six-year-old Minty. No 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 Young Minty came to prefer working outdoors, where she could breathe just a little freer. 
She relished any chance to work outside alongside her father, Ben, who was forced to live apart from the family because he was enslaved by different owners. When Menti Ross was about 13, she paid a visit to a store in Bucktown, Maryland, one she had likely entered countless times before. But this visit was different. A chance encounter would change her life forever. So she was in a general store when an enslaved boy runs in, being chased by his owner or overseer, um, and she's being asked to hold on to him. She refuses to do it. The overseer is so furious, he picks up a, a heavy metal weight and he hurls it in the direction of the enslaved man who's, who's run. But it connects with Araminta's head. It literally fractures her skull. They carried me to the house all bleeding and fainting. I had no bed, no place to lie on at all. And I stayed there all day and next. It took her months to recover. She had no medical care. And it left her suffering with seizures her entire life and horrific headaches. And sometimes these seizures would come upon her without notice. She'd be in the field working, and um, she would just fall to the ground, and she would have tremendous visionary activity. She sometimes felt that she was floating above the earth and looking down at the people watching her lying on the ground. She sometimes referred to them as sleeping spells. Um, and it was during these sort of moments of either semi or unconsciousness that she would see things that she understood as signposts from her god. The visionary side of Harriet Tubman conflated with the intense religiosity of the time and place so that her visions had a religious dimension and she interpreted them as religious. As soon as Menti regained her health, her owner, Edward Brodus, hired her out again. But as she got older, Menti saw a way to use Brodus's greed to her advantage. She offered to pay him a yearly fee for the privilege of hiring herself out to masters of her own choosing. And her world started to open. She worked in the house and then in their fields, and they were merchants and shipbuilders, and so they sent her to the docks, and she would load and unload um, things from the ships coming into port. And she became very, very strong. Eventually, she was allowed to work in the forest with her father, who was an expert uh, lumberjack, timber foreman, and ship carpenter. And um, she became even stronger and more capable. She wasn't just in one locality, but moving around from place to place. It wouldn't have been shocking to see Harriet Tubman on the roads in, in Dorchester County. Um, and she knew the landscape because of her travels. She's a woman who's outside. The watermen that she may be interacting with from the Chesapeake are watermen are very knowledgeable, worldly people. They carry the information because they're on the information highway, which is the waters. So she may have gleaned quite a bit of information from these watermen. In many ways, the border state of Maryland was unique. There was a large network of over 60,000 free blacks who lived and worked side by side with nearly 90,000 enslaved. In this mix of enslaved and free, the taste of freedom was real and tangible. Around 1844, Menti met a free black man named John Tubman. When they married, Araminta Ross became Harriet Tubman. When we think about the union between an enslaved woman and a free man, we automatically say, why on earth 
Would a free person, a free man, make the decision to marry an enslaved woman? Why would he do that? Why would he ensure that any children they were to have would be enslaved? And I always sort of answer that question with a one word answer, which is love. In the fall of 1849, Harriet's owner, Edward Brodus, died, leaving his widow deeply in debt. Enslaved people knew that the death of a master meant trouble for them. Human property was often used to settle debts. After Harriet watched the widow Broda sell one group of enslaved people at auction, she decided to leave everyone and everything she knew and loved to run. She tried to convince her husband, John, to go along with her. But he was not having any of that. I don't think he was ready to make that trip to the North, understanding that if he was captured, then all the freedom that he did have would be taken instantly. On September 17th, 1849, leaving her husband, John, behind, Harriet Tubman stole away into the night with her two brothers, Ben and Henry. As soon as Eliza Brodus found that they were gone, she posted a reward for their capture. Ran away from the subscriber on Monday the 17th. Three Negroes named as follows. Harry, aged about 19 years. Ben, aged about 25 years, is very quick to speak when spoken to. Minty, aged about 27 years, is of a chestnut color, fine looking and about five feet high. $100 reward will be given for each of the above named Negroes, Eliza Ann Brodus, near Bucktown, Dorchester County, Maryland. When Harriet and her brothers escape, her brothers began to fight with her about the dangers ahead, and they weren't sure about the direction, and she says they dragged her back. By returning, she faced sail to the Deep South, severe whipping or death. But Tubman didn't stay long. Within days, she set out again, alone. This time, there would be no turning back. Traveling alone and mostly on foot at night, she made the journey of about 100 miles from the eastern shore of Maryland through woods, marshes, and swamps on her way to Philadelphia. The moment she crossed from Delaware into Pennsylvania, Harriet Tubman was free. When I found I had crossed that line, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. For Harriet Tubman, Philadelphia was a different world. She'd spent time in Baltimore, but never had Tubman seen a city where no one was enslaved. And Philadelphia was perhaps the most important center in the abolitionist movement. Tubman soon made her way to a group of black abolitionists led by William Still still was regarded as the father of the Underground Railroad. He was a member of the uh, anti-slavery society there. And for a decade leading up to the Civil War, he uh, uh, not only ran a station um, uh, which sheltered and forwarded people coming into the city, um, but he also recorded their stories. In 
When someone decided to escape, they were not simply freeing themselves from a negative situation, but helping to free a whole class of people. So by running, they actually became the first uh, abolitionists. Enslaved people like Harriet Tubman were the original abolitionists. Even white abolitionists constantly referred to instances of black resistance to slavery to argue that that is why we are abolitionists. So not only were they the first abolitionists, but they are the ones who first converted white Americans into abolition. At the time Tubman made her escape, abolitionism was gaining momentum challenging the morality of slavery in newspapers and books from lecterns and pulpits across the nation. Black formerly enslaved people were powerful advocates. The Fugitive Slave Act is the shadow that looms over everything else Tubman does. She begins to enter the speaking circuit, rubbing elbows with now not just planters on the Underground Railroad, but national figures like Frederick Douglass. It's like Sojourner Truth telling these stories, the horrors of slavery, galvanizing a response, uh, pumping up a growing abolitionist movement. She apparently was a fabulous storyteller, and people just hung on her every word. She's spinning these stories, she's got the dialect, and she's got this, this amazing set of experiences that she's had. Harriet Tubman took her place among the many abolitionists building public support for the cause. But she quickly grew impatient with the lecture circuit. For Tubman, the dire situation of enslaved people called for immediate, direct action. Harriet Tubman returned to Dorchester County. Her first goal, to bring her husband, John Tubman, out of Maryland. Harriet was, was excited about going to get her husband, John. Matter of fact, she was so excited that during that time that she was away, she had saved enough money to be able to purchase him a new suit. And so she had a new suit for him, and only to get back to find out that he had taken another wife. She said in lectures that she was so furious she was going to storm into their home and make a big scene. But then she thought better of it, and she cast him out of her heart. It took her a while. The fury was there. She's human. This woman is not a saint. But she did not waste the trip. She gathered folks up and took them out of slavery on that trip, and I think she never looked back. Tubman decided to focus all her energy on helping enslaved people navigate the dangerous journey to freedom. She returned to Maryland again and again, using every tool at her disposal, traveling in the winter months when the nights were longer, employing disguises and deception to evade slavers and bounty hunters alike. Tubman utilized the loose-knit secret network of ordinary people that was called the Underground Railroad. Follow the drinking gods. Follow the drinking It included a whole infrastructure of other people who made it possible for the conductors and station masters to safely do their work. The people who provided money, the people who provided clothing, the people who provided food, uh, the people who lent their wagons. Some of the misconceptions that people have about the Underground Railroad, that it was all white Quakers that ran mm. the network, and that's not true. It was people of all backgrounds, but the foundation of the Underground Railroad was African Americans themselves. Follow the drink of God. Harriet Tubman was denied a formal education, but she did have great literacy. Her father helped train her to survive in the woods and to read that landscape. Uh, her mother, of course, was really important, teaching her folk medicines. 
She grew up in a maritime community, and of course those sailors all knew how to navigate by the stars, so she learned about the night sky. Sometimes her rescue missions would be four days, and other times it could take weeks. Kurt Tedman did a lot of her work at night. Not only was it on land, but also used the marshes and the creeks and the waterways because the hound dogs had a hard time trying to follow the scent. See that band all dressed in white. To be a conductor on the Underground Railroad, like Harriet Tubman, you had to really teach those under your care how they need to behave in every possible circumstance. And she was clear that once you start this path towards freedom, there was no turning back. Famously, when a freedom seeker traveling with her got cold feet, she pulled out a pistol and threatened to use it on him because nobody would be more dangerous to Harriet Tubman than somebody who had come partway with her, given up, and then gone back into slavery. She was short, and she was small, and she was a woman. That pistol gave many of those who were running for their lives a great level of confidence in that she was clearly in charge. Tubman made at least 13 secret missions into slave-holding Maryland. Her vision of freedom had become a reality for at least 70 people. By 1860, the number of enslaved people directly helped by Harriet Tubman was about to explode. Within months of Lincoln's election, the southern states had seceded and formed the Confederate States of America. And in April 1861, the simmering argument over slavery erupted into armed conflict. Tubman recognized that this was the moment when the gradual, constant work of liberating people was now accelerating and an entire people and an entire slave population could now be liberated. I think this was a really uh, critical moment for her and she was determined to give it all she had. And if that meant taking on a role that women didn't ordinarily take on, she was going to do it. This was the moment. Tubman was closely watching the politics of the moment. In January 1863, when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, she knew it would not be enough. She'd already concluded that the South would never be talked out of slavery. The only way to end it would be war. By the time of Lincoln's proclamation, Tubman was already engaged in the war effort, lecturing nursing wounded soldiers, and encouraging black men to aid in the cause. But she wanted to do more. In June of 1863, General Tubman, as John Brown called her, set into motion one of the most daring and successful raids of the war. Northern and Southern newspapers related breathless accounts of Colonel Montgomery's campaign on the Combee River in South Carolina, led by Harriet Tubman. Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers, under the guidance of a black woman, dashed into the enemy's country, struck a bold and effective blow, brought off nearly 800 slaves and thousands of dollars worth of property without losing a man or receiving a scratch. It was a glorious consummation. At least 727 men, women, and children made it onto the Union boats, making General Tubman's raid one of the largest liberations of the war and marking the first major military operation in American history that was planned and executed by a woman. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, 
over me and before I'd be a slave I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free it's hard to stop a calling she believed that it was better to live for cause than just be cause. And this whole thing of seeing people free and fighting for equality and justice and, and the right to live free was just something that was within her. She used her home in upstate New York to shelter elderly, formerly enslaved people who couldn't take care of themselves. And she was a suffragette for the women's right to vote. She was very close to Susan B. Anthony. And at one convention, Harriet Tubman was brought on stage by Anthony, and Tubman said her most famous words. I was a conductor on the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. Harriet Tubman is a hero because she does not have a blueprint for freedom. But what she has is incredible conviction and an incredible will to unmask the brutality of slavery and to fight against it. Harriet Tubman was someone who had these extraordinary capacities for courage, a belief in herself that really was a belief in a divine being that would allow her to do extraordinary things in the world. She is someone who saw herself as having a purpose and who was on earth to deliver on that purpose, which was the purpose of freeing people, the purpose of freedom. I am bound for the promised land. Wow, I have no words. That was awesome. I still have goosebumps. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Sahar Satarzada, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. I echo your sentiments, Wafa. Like what? Every time I rewatch that documentary, always learning something new, just trying to pay attention to what's going on. And I'm excited to invite you all to kind of delve deeper into things that really pulled at you. And I just wanted to, you know, looking at the chat, I wanted to welcome those of you who are here to join us, those who have watch parties, even if we are with your family, that's amazing. I was trying to convince my husband who's a social studies teacher and he didn't even show up. So I give you all props. And I just wanted to kind of have us think about a few questions that can help us maybe think in terms of our own relationship to the documentary, to the history, the significance, and how we also can connect it to the social realities today. And so I wanted to share a link with you all, but before I do that, I am going to just demonstrate how to use Jamboard. I trust maybe a lot of you are already familiar with it, but just in case, I wanted to just get us on it so that we're all on the same page. Okay, so I'm going to share this with you. Let me just get to the front here real quick. Okay, so let me share screen. So this is Jamboard. You will notice that there are a number of questions. So there's a different panel for each question. You can go here. These are the sticky notes. So all you have to do is click here, type whatever you want, 
Hi, this is just a test. And if I want to change the color, let me see, I would like it to be green instead. And so I save and it goes there. The more text I type, the text shrinks. So, and I can also move it anywhere. Just to keep in mind that all of you are going to be engaging with these different slides at once. So if you need to edit it, you can right click on the three dots. So I just want to go here again. You can go to edit. You can duplicate if you want to type and if you want to include another sticky note, or you can delete it if you don't want it there. In terms of going to transitioning through different slides, you just type this these arrow keys and you're able to see there's a total of I believe 11 questions. I don't think there are 12, even though there's 12. Yes, yeah, so there's 11 slides. And I would like to invite you all to maybe look at one or two questions, just a few that really pull you that you'd like to answer, because we don't have a lot of time. Is it about 10 minutes that we have allotted for this? OK, so about 10 minutes. So I will share this. Are there? If there are any questions in the chat, feel free to let me know with regards to if my instructions were unclear about Jamboard. But I will share with you now the link to the Jamboard so that everyone can engage with it at once, which should be the fun part. And so here is the link. So we'll give you about 10 minutes and then we'll come back. Were you able to get the jam board to work? Do you people are not, are people not able to access the jam board? They're saying that it says view only. Oh, my apologies. I was wondering if I had fixed it. Okay, I'm correcting that right now. My apologies. So if you refresh, it should be good to go. I'm sorry. I sincerely apologize for that. I was yep. wondering why no one was posting a mic. Like, There's something on my end. Okay, great. Thank you. And again, I apologize. Yeah, if you refresh, it should be okay. Sahara. Yes. Um, it's still not allowing people to post. Yeah. We can put some of the questions in a chat box. 
Yes. As well? mm -hmm. We can also do that. Do you want me to put the questions in the chat or should people? I'm happy to post them in the chat right now. I'll do that. Okay, so it is working for some people. Thank you, Jennifer. So we'll work it both ways. I have also posted the questions on share screen in case because it's not letting me paste them in the chat box. So sorry for all the technological glitches, folks. Your cooperation and patience is appreciated.
we'll have a few more minutes or should we keep it should we keep going all right So I wanted to thank you all for participating in this. And I, again, I'm sorry for the limitations of Google and Jamboard. And I guess that's one thing to learn, right, as we move along. I just wanted to acknowledge contributions in the chat and also what people have posted. So going to think, look at, at some of the questions in the chat first. Julie says, I think for my teaching, I would like to present or as a teacher instead of conductor, I think it would be more powerful stu to students to view her in that way. It's a you raise a really great point. We're going to be talking about the way that the narrative and even representation of Harriet Tubman, right, and how she has depicted this idea of, of being a conductor. And even the idea of what teacher means and why power, even within the context of the United States and why a teacher is not even seen in a role that is powerful. And we'll talk about how it's even gendered feminine, especially within a US context, right? This idea of education, public education and teaching and educators. We have Jean, right? I think we can honor Harriet Tubman and how we teach and interact with our students, being cognizant of all students and teaching to their strengths. Present her as a teacher. We can teach the noble quality of Harriet Tubman by teaching in the first grade. So elementary study will understand no matter how small you are can still make a difference, right? And that's one thing I was trying to do with the questions is how can we use these for our respective disciplines or subject areas? maybe even challenging and undisciplining ideas, right? And trying to show interdisciplinarity, non-disciplinarity in terms of the fact that the real world doesn't work in these segregated, you know, factions and fragments. And let's see, teachable moments, working hard to achieve your goals. Never give up, grit, stamina, taking care of total strangers for a positive outcome. And this idea of even what Harriet would like to be called, right? So Harriet Tubman, who was born Araminta Ross, right? And this idea of she was identified as Minty throughout the documentary, reminding us that she was a child, that she had a childhood, but it was, it was a childhood that was rocked right? It's not a childhood that everyone experiences. And it's still very common today when you talk about childhood in a racialized way. Childhood even today is not equal and universal in this United States, especially when we talk about Black childhood, right? And so Minty, Araminta Ross, marries John Tubman. She chose to take his name and changed her first name to Harriet after her mother, right? So this idea of what she'd like to be called is really interesting. I don't think she specified that, but she chose that name. And that is all that we know. And one thing we'll talk about is this idea of records and knowledge of Harriet Tubman and who wrote the narratives and what kind of narratives are depicted of her. And so I see people are continuing to contribute to the chat. So great, her, her selfless acts, right? In terms of the fact that despite the danger, the courage that she manifested in these times, teachable moment, I would have my students do a writing assignment or discussion where they make a choice. Would they stay a slave for fear of leaving? Would you join the Underground Railroad in hopes of freedom? So that question happens in a lot of cases and it's often been problematized. And we're gonna talk about this idea of how it's not really possible to take on the role of someone that you are, you know, the status of someone that you have not experienced, right? And even kind of the nuances that are avoided when we don't talk about those things. So I think it's really important, we have to be careful. I've heard of a lot of enactments that happen, you know, in terms of during the time of slavery, even how enactments happen, you know, colonial enactments and underground railroad enactments. And I think we have to think about the implications of what they are doing and even trying to appropriate and kind of perform injustice and oppression can be really problematic and dangerous. And actually it's really problematic and dangerous. And I think 
to simplify those rules, there's other ways that I think we can think about what, how we can learn from these experiences without putting ourselves in their particular shoes in that kind of way, right? Especially if we can't relate. But I wanted to also kind of look at what people have shared. You know, I hope people are looking, there's some really great things that people are sharing with regards to teachable moments, the medical challenges, right? This idea, her, she was very constructively resilient and she was persistent. These ideas that people are sharing, teaching about enslavers rather than owners. Yes, who is being centered in the narrative, right? And even the language of using enslaved versus using the term slave, right? Because using that language implies that slave is an identity that people are an object. And actually it, it's something that happened to people. It's not something that defines who they are. And I think I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, about the dangers of replicating narratives of damage and how it's actually just replicating another form of oppression. Even if our intent is benevolent, even if we're well-intended, we can still reproduce narratives of harm and something to just think about. And so this is great. I'll send this link to others if people are interested in the questions. And I think it's great that we have some US history students joining us as well. So hopefully you all have also contributed to the conversation because I think it's always important to learn things from the perspectives of students, as, you know, not only educators, because it's easy to realize that like Paulo Freire says, we are simultaneously educators and students, right? So we're learners and students. So talking about these ideas of, right, watching short increments. And the other thing is you don't even have to watch the documentary if you feel that the grade level you are teaching won't be able to digest, but maybe take the songs from it, right? There's a lot of spirituals that are shared in terms of what is the significance of that, or even doing a storytelling activity that's based on the documentary, which you'll notice is very humanizing and it shows a lot of representation that we often don't see in the history of Harriet Tubman, not only in books, but AP exams, and also in terms of just, you know, class lessons. So things to just think about in terms of these different ideas. So the reason I wanted to share why I ask these questions, there are things that think, I think we think a lot about this idea that I know we live in a state and I have a confession to make. I am not very familiar with Indiana as most of you are. And you are experts in your field you are experts as ed, as teachers in in public education, as you know, in schools across Indiana, and I am not. I work in a university, and I understand that I have more autonomy and privileges and freedoms that you might not have, you know, in your lessons in your schools, in your districts, and even in terms of contention you may face from neighborhoods, from other parents, from guardians, right, and communities, and even just the policies of the state and thinking about those kind of things. So one thing you'll notice throughout, I kind of like to give a shout out to really amazing artists and particularly black women. And so this is a woven piece by Bisa Butler. She does all her art basically through quilting and creating, you know, fabrics and textiles and just weaving them together. And she did this beautiful piece on Harriet Tubman. And so the reason I was saying that these questions came to mind is thinking about WFYI has really lovely resources for the classroom that we can engage with. And the lovely Ms. Brittany came up with a wonderful list of resources that we will be sharing with you all as well. And I don't know if people wanna drop it in the chat now and we can share it again at the end, but there's a lot of resources that you can also complement with what WFYI has. And if you find that there's more critical ways that you want to engage that complement that, I highly invite and encourage you to do so. So, 
thinking about this idea that Harriet Tubman was building this idea of liberation on a dream and how no matter what you are experiencing, no matter what hardship or trials, that the dream never fades. And this idea that every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Now, it's easy for me to say that, but when I think of someone like Harriet Tubman saying that, and the fact that the belief that you had this dream to change the world and you actually achieved it. There's this piece from Eve Tuck. She's an indigenous scholar and she wrote this piece, this lovely piece called Suspending Damage. And in Suspending Damage, it's a letter to fellow educators and researchers in education asking everyone in the community to, can we please stop talking about ourselves and writing about ourselves as damaged and broken? And so in our teaching and learning, and through this inspiring documentary, right, it actually challenged these damage-centered narratives that pathologize people as being oppressed and that's all they are, right? So what about the amazing capacities and the nobility of people like Harriet Tubman and those whom she helped liberate and free? So those are the kind of things that I think about instead of thinking about these narratives of the shackled enslaved one. And I think it's important to talk about the historical context of why oppression exists. Oftentimes we talk about people and communities without talking about the historical context of why things happen the way that they did. And therefore we minimize and do pathologize people like people of African descent to being enslaved, right? but we don't talk about the amazing achievements. And sometimes we fall into stereotypes that we think are positive, like the strong black woman, that she must go through pain. The black superwoman, she must endure such hardship and pain because that's how strong she is. And that was also how slavery was justified, that you work people to death because people of African descent racially can tolerate it. And it was actually diagnosed, right? as a medical condition that people of African descent can be worked to death. So the twistedness of using these tropes and stereotypes, even again, if well-intentioned, we can definitely perpetuate these forms of oppression. So I love the fact that Harriet Tubman speaks truth and keeps it real. And she's, she tells it like it is. She said, listen, I did all this work for eight years. I never ran the train off the track. I did what I was supposed to do. And again, going to these ideas of the nobility, right? The beauty of what she has done, not the suffering and the pain only and that she endured, but also the beauty of what she accomplished and how we can also learn from that and how in the midst of trials to also see this amazing capacity to transform oppression into liberation. I think is really powerful. This is a quote from Shonda Prescott Weinstein. She is a professor and she is an astrophysicist and a, um, she is also a nuclear theorist. And she talks about Harriet Tubman as an astronomer. And I just love this idea of, we often don't think about the fact of how Harriet Tub Tubman exemplified Black knowledge production through astronomy and stars and the land and cartography and mapping. And there's always this narrative that she was uneducated, but education is not always formal, what we learn in our public schools. So this fact of this idea that she has this knowledge and she's producing it and she's sharing it to the point that they've made it a song. So it's become code, it's become language for people to use, right? so that those enslavers don't understand what's going on. And so I think it's really powerful to think there's only one book that was recorded during her time that actually said she didn't know where she was going, but she said she followed the North Star and that's what that was her guide. So some of the themes that come up 
And you all will let me know, how am I on time? Because I don't want to. Am I good on time? I just want to make sure. Okay. Are we good on time? I don't want to jibber jabber the whole time. We got five minutes left. Everybody. Okay, great. So there were a lot of themes that came out, you know, watching this documentary and re-watching the documentary. And one of the questions that I that was in the jam board is how do we connect this to the social reality in which we live today? Abolition is one example. You know, abolition within the context within the context of slavery. And ending slavery has now manifested today to people wanting to end carcerality and the fact of mass incarceration and police and police violence, and especially connecting to the role of police in our schools and what are the implications of that and particular schools. So abolition is still relevant today. It's still a movement that happens, even representation. Did you notice who the subject experts were? who was speaking, who was represented, and who was also centered in the stories that were being told. These are great ways to have students and even as educators ourselves be like, what are things that I also noticed that I didn't notice or pay attention to, or even watch it again, right? Opportunities for storytelling. We talked about language and vocabulary, right? Like using terms like enslaved, talking about liberation, using the word conductor, teacher, these kind of ideas. I talked about undisciplining already, the arts. There's so much art and artists, especially Black artists, African-American artists, who can be featured in terms of even teaching a lesson on Harriet Tubman. So things to think about. One thing that I thought was really fascinating is this idea of how the Underground Railroad is kind of an example of one of the first forms of social networking that ever happened. So imagine how we are networking right now on social media, you know, across different websites. But the fact that, as some people have noted in your responses, people that Harriet Tubman did not know, but it was just through connections and connections that the Underground Railroad was established. And to be able to trust people that you do not know, that's pretty powerful. So the fact of even social networking happening in this way in relationship building and relationality and reciprocity, I think is really deep. We talked about childhood and how it was not the same for people like Harry Tubman, right? And what are the implications of that? How do we bring that into a lesson? How is the childhood of your students, you know, and in relation to one another? And how do we talk about the fact that childhood does not exist for everyone equally and justly as it should, right? talked about qualities, black knowledge production, even this idea of spirituality and how it was connected to her epile epileptic right seizures, this idea of having the spiritual connection of having insight and vision. And what does that mean? And even the spirituals in terms of the songs and the virtues, we talk about justice, love, persistence, courage. These are all virtues, right? That are considered spiritual. And I'm not saying religious, I'm saying spiritual. Like what are things that are of the spirit, right? So disability is something that we don't often think about when we think about Harriet Tubman. And so I think it's powerful to talk about the conversation of disability and how it was used as a form of power by Harriet Tubman rather than as a pathologizing brand of weakness or being less than. And I think these are things to think about. We talked about cartography and mapping and what are the different ways you can map, whether it's mapping you know, networks, mapping the stars, even mapping on the land, right? Like these different ideas of what it means. And again, coming back to this idea of what are narratives we can rewrite? How can we relearn them? How can we teach them? How do we challenge the narratives that are oppressive by reimagining and rewriting and teaching ones that decenter whiteness or decenter enslavers, right? Or that decenter oppression. And that is really all. I I can jibber jabber forever, but and I wish we could have gone through all the slides, but I look forward to going through all of them again. But I just wanted to thank you all for your time and for having me here. And I think we're gonna open for to QA for anyone who's and hopefully it's a conversation, not just a unidirectional, you know, kind of thing. So thank you. So feel free, please, to drop any questions that you might have in the Q&A. 
and Dr. Satarzad will uh, will help you answer them. We have a question in the chat box from Leslie Scott. I'm trying to see is the question. I, it's in the webinar chat. I can read it to you. She says, hello, oh, my name is Leslie, Leslie, and my five-year-old nephew, Jet, is watching with me. He loves Harriet Tubman, and he has watched every documentary he could find about her. Christmas morning, he walked in and saw his Harriet Tubman golden book under the tree and screamed with joy. Thank you for opening up this viewing for others to participate. So glad that your nephew has joined us. Welcome, Jet. And I see this comment from Julie. I think it's a great point. There are too many. I think it's also how we learned, right? We've learned to focus so much on connecting Harry Tubman with slavery that we don't also talk about the human element of how that doesn't de define her, but the fact that she's liberatory and powerful and the things, you know, that Harriet Tubman was. But the problem is like being raised in slavery is not something you can also disconnect from Harriet Tubman either. But I think you're right. There are many ways to teach about Harriet Tubman, right? Without centering just this narrative of slavery. And I think that's a great point. I put a link to the um, resources and I put a link to the documentary. It should still be there, a full length one. Um, those should be there in the chat and I will try to repost them again. Do you have any other questions for Dr. Uh, Satar Zada? Or for anyone, even if it's just anyone. to like invite a conversation. I love these comments that are coming in. And one thing we didn't talk about that I like the how your comments are reminding me is it's featuring a Black woman. Oftentimes in history, it's men who are centered. And you'll notice a lot of the subject experts were Black women, right? And so this idea of, in the documentary, it talks about how Harriet Tubman and John Brown met at Kambahi River. And Kambahi River is very significant, even though this event between Harriet with that the revolt happened with Harriet Tubman in 1863. If you move forward 114 years later, the Kambahi River Collective was formed, which is a Black feminist movement, which was the very first time that this idea of diverse identities intersecting, being, you know intersectionality as Kimberly Crenshaw talks about. This is the first time that issues of gender, race, class, ethnicity, language, right, and socioeconomic status, et cetera, came out. So this fact that the Kambahi River Collective is named after this place where this revolutionary, you know, act event took place with Harriet Tubman in mind is really powerful. There's another question by Suzanne Erickson in the Q&A portion. Our high school has a commitment to teaching about tough conversations, equity, and community. We host a community panel with members from our town. 
Do you have suggestions of questions to have students ask? That is a great, great thing that you have this idea of tough conversation. And it's interesting because at, um, what are they, they have these different like names for conversations, tough conversations about it. And I think it would be interesting to know what questions do students come to mind first? I don't know if I would want to suggest certain questions, but what pulls them? You know, in terms of these ideas, I think it's always powerful to always think about what are things that they can connect to their own social realities and what can they use opportunities to actually transform, right? Transform opportunities. So in terms of having specific questions to ask, I think I would be interested to know in terms of what are ways that you can actually transform the high school? Like what are opportunities in terms of not only transforming it as an institution, but maybe at the individual level, like what can individual students do? Also, I think it would be helpful to see what about the community level? What transformation can be made? And then also thinking about the institutional level, what can be done in terms of transformation? This way, I think it gives students agency to know that even at the individual level, there are things they can do to actually promote some kind of change and transformation within the institution on particular topics and issues that are very relevant, but also very important and necessary to address within the high school that are often not, right? So hopefully that, that helped. Is there... I think we got all of them answered, correct? I believe. Yeah, Jennifer Gill has been, right? Are you good? Yeah, hers has been, and then I, you just answered Suzanne Erickson's. Um, okay. And I, no, and I'm great. I'm so happy to hear that the resources that Brittany compiled, thank you again, Brittany, that the Kambahi River Collective is in there. And so the great thing is actually it's accessible online for free and it's a great resource that's connected. Thank you, Dr. Saha. We really have appreciated your time. And before I turn this over to um, Mr. Swan, I wanted to give the names of um, the winners for our giveaway. WFYI has been gracious enough to give us five copies of the full documentary. Um, and so we just randomly drew the names here and I hope you're still here to claim your prize. Um, bro, uh, sorry, uh, Seth Easterday, and please forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your names properly. Uh, Suzanne Erickson, Heidi Slavkin, Darina Ingram, Janet Chandler. Congratulations to the five of you. Um, you will be getting a copy of the uh, documentary um, and we'll be sending that to you in the mail. So congratulations to everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Sahad, for your presentation. And Mr. Swan, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming with us this Thursday uh, for this special screening. I hope that you're able to pick up some points uh, from the, the slides, the jam board, and the conversation and the things in the chat that will encourage you to be the, the, the good educators that you are. The next event that we have planned will take place on Tuesday, February the 28th in our diversity series. It's going to be called uh, Courageous Conversations Through Interactive Read Alouds. And you should be getting that link uh, sometime the 1st of February as we continue to uh, do our racial affairs committee, diversity trinity, training, and affinity group awareness. And again, I want to thank you for your time with us this evening. Uh, enjoy the weekend. I'm sure most of you, uh, if you're an educator, you would not be working Monday uh, because it's a holiday for us educators. So we have a four day weekend. So I want to thank you uh, again for your time. Have a good evening.
Trying to go through and remove the people who are still here. <laughs> Jesse, can you stop the recording? Yeah. Thank you.